Hey guys, welcome to Two Sticks. Uh, thank you for joining us for another video. We're going to do a discussion today. My name is Scott. I'm Lita. This is going to be a discussion about space travel and how that relates to science fiction. And we may also take it into a few other directions as well. We're going to just try to um, see what happens yeah. and, and play loose. And Here's a shout out. Yeah. This was inspired. I was on Facebook with one of my Facebook friends. Jeffrey, it's like G E O F. G -O, it sounds like you're saying get off, but it's Jeff. Jeffrey Nanak Neal from New Zealand, I believe, and uh, uh, he he inspired this because he's like, hey, this is a you know here's some ideas, and I said I'll, I'll run it by my co-host. I, I think I'm your co-host, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, so Jeffrey, this is for you, and you know Jeff, just a little bit about a little bit of shout out for Jeffrey, his beloved passed away recently, Jelena, so let's uh, let's do it in her honor, okay? Yes, in her memory. So, um, I guess we'll, we'll start out with just uh, some general questions or topics ha uh, relating to space travel and science fiction. Um, what, to you, Belita, is like the most interesting or fascinating sub-area or sub-topic of space travel today or what what uh, current events or phenomena that are happening right now do you do you find to be the most engaging well uh, I've got two things to say the most fascinating thing to me in general about space exploration is everything that we're doing was present in science fiction before we got to the moon someone was like let's go to the moon and here's how it looked like and there were stories like Cyrano de Bergerac went to the moon you know and there's, I think even an Arabic science fiction story that was written centuries ago where someone went there on moonbeams or whatever the hell it was, right? Yeah. And then everything that we envision in science fiction has come true. Not quite like it was in the books, but it's like a blueprint. You know what's funny, uh, you mentioned that is one of the earliest films that was ever made. Yes. Actually black and white film I've seen was it. Yeah, yeah, about going to the moon and they actually shot in the movie they sh shoot this guy out of a cannon right but they shoot him out so hard that he leaves earth's orbit and crashes on the on the, on moon. the moon yeah yeah so. and jules verne and hg wells talked about these things so it's it's uh now what you said about what you asked about the thing that stands out most today is that it's become international and privatized it used to be soviet union america soviet union america no one else was in space now you've got the Chinese, they have a rover on the moon going around taking pictures, surveying the place, building up a library of photographs, right? You've got the Indians actually used a computer projection to find a way to, to make their space program so cheap that it cost less for them to go to Mars than it did for us to develop the space shuttle, right? So that's like a humongous game-changing thing and you know, there's other nations that are in space right now. Like, uh, they have sat their own satellites, for example. I was born in Turkey. Um, the Turkish government now has a space program, and what they're doing is they're doing it on the cheap by renting space on, on the European Ariane rocket launcher, right? And of course, who's the man? Elon Musk, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that, that, that's what stands out to me. But I, I got a question for you. Sure. Right? You know, we, we both, we're both into sci-fi in different ways and, uh, you know, we have conversations about this stuff. Where, would, where do you think we should go next and what do you think we should do next? Uh, as far as space travel is concerned, mm -hmm. I would be really fascinated if we could get our best and brightest minds uh, to utilize the moon uh, to its fullest capacity because the moon is closest. It's... You know, I think we started an initiative under George W. Bush to return to the moon by 2020, and you know that that plan was revised by Barack Obama. I guess it was underfunded, and it was a bad plan. We've, uh, you know, we've been trying to get back to the moon and put people back on the moon, um, and everyone's talking about going to Mars because that's the next logical. Um, it's place more to like to. the Earth than the moon. Yeah. But I would just, you know, we have this planetary body real close to us rel relatively, and I would be interested to see what value we could ex extract from putting personnel and bases there, all in the name of, like, international interests, right? I don't want any country going to the moon and claiming monopoly. the moon is theirs. 
Um, but yeah, it seems like we have. I, I think that's right what's here. happening. I think that's what's happening. <clears throat> if you think about it, um, we got there. Mm -hmm. right. The United States got there first, and Russia was like, you got there first, this is too expensive, we're not going to do it, right? And if now, now the conspiracy theorists say we never got there, you know? Right. And yeah. who knows, it might, I'm willing to believe anything, I've looked at some interesting evidence, but I think we got there. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we, we put a flag there, we're like, we claim this for the United States, right? And then China got there, and they're like, oh yeah, we're going to survey the moon. And I think India put an orbiter around the moon to photograph it, right? And one of the ways you claim land is you're like, well, I surveyed it. Yeah. So now the U.S., China, and India, in, in their own ways, have a claim to the moon. Could that result in a war in the future? I don't know. I would rather see cooperation. Because there was a sci-fi novel, um, I think it was called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, right? And it talks about if you actually do establish a base on the moon, you can... You can launch projectiles at the Earth and bombard the Earth with, with moon rocks, and that would be one hell of a military advantage. And you could do it with like what they call a linear accelerator, which is basically magnets. Yeah. Right? And so whoever establishes a permanent base on the moon has a tremendous military advantage because it's easy to get something from the moon to the Earth, hard to get something from Earth to the moon. Just gra sheer gravity, you know? Yeah, and I'm not an astronomer or, you know, a... Uh not somebody who studies moon rocks all day, but there might be resources there that we don't know about yet that are still untapped. I've been uh, on that. I've been I've been reading up on that. Yeah, and it just seems like, you know, instead of worrying about going to Mars right away, we should focus on that. But also, I don't want to see a lot of manned missions out into space because I think that introduces so many different complications and slows everything down. Um, there's so much more you have to think about when you talk about preserving human life over these large yeah. voyages. Yeah, we, we have things that we didn't have back then that are game changing. Yeah. Like, I, I'll give you an example. If, if we wanted, uh, first of all, now, now that they, they know more about the moon, there's titanium on the moon, there's silicon, there's water on the moon. They've established that there's water. There could be caverns in the moon or, or the interior structure is lighter than the outer structure because they actually uh, made an impact on the moon and they had seismic sensors and they're like, it sounds like the moon is hollow or less dense on the inside than on the outside, so maybe there's caverns on the moon. So there are resources on the moon. Water, metals, of course rock, right? And if there are caverns, you don't have to build a moon base, you just inhabit the cavern and seal it. Yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. there's something else on the moon. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere, which means the solar radiation reaching the moon during its sunlight is much more intense than over here. So a solar especially if you, as the solar power get, technology gets better, is you can extract much more power from the solar array than you can on Earth. Mm -hmm. And that's, so you have material, power, and space, right? And uh, well, I'm, I'm with you, like you said, you don't want a lot of manned missions. I think that was more of a glory thing, like, we, we're Americans, we do things in a big way, like, like a football game, like, let's rush there, get there, boom, plant the flag, we're done, we won. Yeah. Whereas like the Chinese and the Indians are like meticulous, slow paced. They're more interested in building, surveying and then probably building an infrastructure there before they even send a person there. Yeah, right. we, we wanted to score a touchdown basically. <laughs> Great you know, analogy. We wanted to get somebody's feet on the ground there. And that's all well and good, but uh, like Belita was saying, I mean, you have India and China using unmanned artificial intelligence to explore outer space and the moon and I think future missions to places like Mars um, or Venus if we would even dream of venturing to Venus um, I think it would have to be some sort of unmanned probe I think it would be more economical I think we could do it sooner and I think there would be a lot less risk obviously of, of human of losing human life and human right. peril so it just checks all across the board you know it makes so much more sense to do that but it's not as sexy is the problem. I, I actually wanted to, uh, like, I, I write sci-fi, right? Mm -hmm. So I've written some sci-fi in, involving space exploration. But um, I, I have this story that I, that I started but couldn't quite finish. And in the story, in the future, um, the Mexicans got into space travel, mm -hmm. right? It's more of an international consortium, China, Mexico, Africa, right? Because these are, these are countries that were, are relatively low-tech now and not so powerful, but they have a lot of resources. So mm -hmm. if, you, if they were to have power and 
technology, they could do something with those resources. And India's doing it, China's doing it. So, so in the story, there's a guy from America who actually basically immigrated to Mexico so he could get, go in the space program. And they're in orbit around Jupiter looking for resources, right? Well, I kind of have this joke. I'm like, I want the, to get the Mexicans on the moon. And I'll tell you why, okay? They build the crap out of shit, <laughs> right? If you look at Mexico, all the ancient Mexicans, they built those pyramids. Yeah. Like, the rest of the Americas is kind of forested, hunter-gatherers. The Mexicans are building centralized planning, plumbing, right? And nowadays, like, on the East Coast, all the contractors, they hire Mexicans, yeah. right? So... So if you, if you could get a construction project going on the moon, an international construction project, right? Like, I want to go to the moon when there's apartment complexes there. I want to go to the moon when there's like, not a dome, but maybe like an underground complex with a shopping mall, swimming pools, <laughs> and lawns. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there's some artificial, uh, artificial grass up there and see how that... And I don't think know. we're going to get that with just one nation. I don't think it's possible to make the moon habitable with just one nation. That's what we need, though. We need a global uh, fund and efforts towards uh, building things like space stations, bases, exploring outer space. We need to start pooling our resources and pooling our scientists as different nations to be able to accomplish these goals because the Outer Space Treaty that was started, I think, in 1960 or, mm -hmm. or 61, initially had like 10 signatures on it. Now it's got over 107 signatures on it. And it basically um, says that a nation can't claim a body like the moon for itself, and, and it can't militarize it. And so if those yeah. if those Although treaties get broken. <laughs> treaties do get broken, but if, if uh, that kind of a global international effort um, you know, legislative effort has already been attempted and is being signed by all these different nations. Why aren't we pooling all of our resources together to create an international space? Oh, well, first of all, there are there are powers that be, forces that be, <laughs> that that love the idea of us being at war with each other. There's there's a lot of profit to be made in war. What's going on in the Middle East? We we launch a bunch of missiles at Syria. That's a hundred million dollars spent in one day. Which which means that those miss now they have to buy replacements and you know there's a lot of money being spent on on many of these wars are are just fomented uh, you know they're artificially induced they don't have to be there and mm -hmm. as long as we're continually fighting each other uh, making bombs and you know making poison gas bombs and anthrax bombs and you know jet airplanes as long as we're spending money on that we we are actually missing the fact that these resources we're fighting over are all over the solar system. Yeah. Right? The moon is just packed full of metal. It's, yeah. packed, it's packed full of stuff we could use. And here's the other thing. Mars has resources, right? And there's nobody there. We don't have to fight anybody to take over Mars, right? We just, we just go like, ah, well, I'm, we're here. Do you mind if I set up here? No, you're not here. Okay. It's amazing because we haven't discovered alien life on any signs of alien life yet, at least not officially recognized ones. Uh, Although there is maybe so, some evidence there was life on Mars, like yeah. on a meteorite. But if it's true, there's no other advanced civilizations to compete with in our immediate uh, solar system in our neighborhood, then we shouldn't have any problem just, you know, gathering up all the resources we would ever need. You know, all that has to take place is we have to get our shit together. Basically, <laughs> yeah, easier said than. Oh, I got something to say about Mars. I got okay. something to say about Mars. This is this is, um, you know, because we we both saw The Martian at different points, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I know that's one movie you've seen, and uh, I'll tell you something about Mars that science fiction movies never talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see people going to Mars and something happens, like like Matt Damon's character. He get he actually got pierced with like a rod that went through his uniform and yeah. like popped out the other end. Um, Here's the thing people, people don't know about spacesuit technology and um, vacuum sealing technology. It leaks. It always leaks. All spacesuits leak to a degree. All space stations leak to a degree. Isn't that a rule of physics, too? Like, everything leaks, no right. matter what it is. But here's what I'm saying. <laughs> and they leak more at the joints than along the, the long axes, right? right? So the minute people start walking around on Mars, the minute an inhabited spaceship lands on Mars, okay, 
our microbes are going to be be on that planet. Uh, what, what was that that alien movie uh, where they show the covenant? Not co the one before where um, you start thinking of Valerian. No, 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 no. But that was an awesome movie. That's the, the great movie. All right, now I'm talking <laughs> about the alien movie where the where the giant white dude drinks the thing and then dissolves and populates the earth. You know, that was Alien Covenant. That was Covenant. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 you're thinking no. of Prometheus. Prometheus, right, you're okay. Prometheus. You don't need that. You don't, like, all you need to put life on a planet is empty your toilet. Like your bilge pipe, you know, like, you take a shit on the spaceship, and then you, you're all filled up, you're like, we got no place to put this. Yeah, just dump this on the Martian sand, right? The winds will take that microorganisms all over the entire damn planet, and anywhere there's water, anywhere that that life is able to flourish, it's going to flourish. <laughs> Mars is going to be colonized by life from Earth inevitably the minute we land there. You know what that says to this kind of funny, mm. and this is a side tangent, but uh, everyone like wonders tangents. how life got started on this planet. Everyone says it was God. Some people say it couldn't have been God, whatever you believe. Yeah. It could have been some advanced race <laughs> millions and millions of years ago dumping, or, billions. You know, billions of years ago, driving by and dumping their... Uh, Sewage on our planet. That do you know the first? <laughs> do you know who came up with that theory? Who was that? There was a scientist that came up with that theory and stated that that's probably how life got started on Earth. That's crazy. Sir Francis Crick, the guy who basically DNA. decoded uh, DNA, because yeah. he at the time he's kind of revised it. He said, "This is the DNA and the RNA, how it zips and unzips and try." He's like, "This is so complex. This could have never arise naturally." He said. Someone created this. Someone made this because he was kind of, he's not really a religious person. He said some aliens either seeded the planet that way or they dumped they dump their 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 shit on our planet at one point. And that's yeah. how it got inhabited. And that's a whole nother area too. We've already talked about UFOs, so I don't want to go into UFOs really with you guys or disclosure or any of that any of that stuff. We could do another video. But uh, <laughs> we probably could, but but astrobiology, right? Studying life out in space. I mean, that's something where if we do, uh, by chance, encounter another advanced species uh, during our travels out in space, like we need to be able to encounter them as the human race from planet Earth. Like we have to right. make sure that our space initiatives are are uh, cooperative. cooperative, that they're right. global, that they include everybody. Because how's it going to look if if we uh, meet some alien species and let's say they live on Europa and we're like yeah we're from Earth they're like oh you're Earthlings you're like no actually well I'm from Baltimore he's from Detroit uh, I'm that from other Detroit guy's, from New Jersey man <laughs> he's from this guy's <laughs> from New Jersey that other guy's from uh, uh, you know where wherever we, else. we are we are Panama not a city now 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 funny you talked about astrobiology right mm -hmm. um, or I like to call it xenobiology I, li yeah. I like that term what you what we talked about earlier how the life got started here right that introduces two terms okay which show up in science fiction it shows it shows up in the alien franchise uh -huh. alien you know prometheus especially right, right? It, it's called panspermia which means like like the transference of life from one planet to another and then that was kind of francis crick talked about that right and um it creates two different terms called directed or direct panspermia and undirected or indirect panspermia and, and basically it means like when we go to Mars because I believe we will go there when we go to the Mars when a person lands there no matter no matter what our technology at some point we're going to contaminate that planet and that's going to be an example of involuntary direct panspermia right yeah so now here's another thing and this, this is, uh, say, say you have a planet like the Earth, okay, and something happens to it. Like a massive, super fast asteroid hits it and it wipes out most life on that planet. But when it does, it knocks up all this dust. All, it, it knocks up pieces of that planet and actually they, they achieve escape velocity because the asteroid that hit it had both mass and speed, right? Mm -hmm. It could land on other planets in that solar system. And if that life is capable of dormancy, which much life is, yeah. all right, it will inhabit that planet. And they think that's how life might have come here. They, 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 there's some evidence that Mars may have had microbial life at some point because it did have water. Obviously, you see erosion, right? 
that life came here and, and populated the earth and did you ever hear about tardigrades yeah yeah, yeah, that's what I think of when you start when you say things like that. And um, we're not just talking about Star Trek Discovery now. No, we're no. About the actual target. These are microscopic. They look like little slugs or caterpillars, um, but they're really cool creatures. Scientists are just now starting to study them a lot more. They, I think, they go dormant when they're in water, mm -hmm. um, and they go into like a comatose state. Uh, but these things are crazy. They can survive temperatures close to absolute zero. Uh, they can survive temperatures thousands, <laughs> thousands of degrees Celsius. They can even survive in the vacuum of space. Okay, Speaking these creatures of that. are so. If you're talking about panspermia and life coming, um, riding on the back of an asteroid or meteorite somewhere, it's like these are like the perfect candidate, man. I'm not even sure those evolved yeah. on planet Earth. Who no. Well, there is, there is a theory that that um, the universe is old, right? Mm -hmm. And it may just be that. That in the early stages of the universe, it was there were conditions for life in outer space. The more we look in outer space, we see like clouds. You know, some some clouds are bigger than two or three solar system of organic compounds, mm -hmm. all the components of, of life, including water. And it may be that life actually arises in these interstellar clouds, and that may have actually happened before there were even conditions for planets, right? And if that's the case, then life may have originated way before Earth and have actually, in other words, life may be all around the, the cosmos in some form or another, and it may be actually more uniform than we would think, but I want to add another point here. I want to add another point here. The International Space Station, the Russians found plankton on the outside of their space station. <laughs> right? There was plankton yeah. and, and on the windows, because it was fogging up, there was like, what is, what has happened to our windows? Because there's something, and they went on the spacewalk, they took it, they're like, plankton, was able to exist in low Earth orbit. And, and they think that maybe it's possible that either, either the spaceship got contaminated at the facility or on the way up, but all their facilities are, are inland. They're, they're not by the ocean, from what I, what I can tell. Or maybe just on the way up in the atmosphere, it, it just picked up some airborne plankton. Or, as I said, technology leaks, right? And it might have just been algae or something leaking from inside the space station. Yeah. And it found a way to live in the, in the high radiation <laughs> vacuum of space. That's crazy. Right? It reminds me of that. Um, you remember Jurassic Park? I love that movie. Remember uh, Jeff Goldblum in that Life movie? Life Finds a Way. Yeah, exactly. Can, can you do the, the whole monologue, you know? Uh, I don't know if I can do the whole monologue, but they're basically, they're telling them, yeah. uh, they're like, well, that's impossible. They can't breed all the... Uh, dinosaurs in Jurassic Park are female. Frog DNA, baby. <laughs> yeah, and then they look, they pan over to Jeff Goldblum, and he's like, "Life finds a way." He says, you know, "He's like, what you what you call the quest for knowledge, I call the rape of the natural world." <laughs> you know? Wouldn't it be crazy yeah, if we went to Europa and went fishing, and there was like a fucking megalodon under there or something? Something. Some crazy. I don't know. <clears throat> That kind of uh, stuff freaks me out a little bit because everybody thinks that sci-fi movies are all good fun, <laughs> and they are fun. But how predictive has sci-fi fiction been throughout history? And what's you know sh some shit's really going to go down if we go to Europa, and, and we we better not find something. How we better if, find? If I want to find something there. Wait, listen to you. I want to find something. When we go fishing something. on Europa, and we find some sea life there, some macro mm -hmm. sea life. People are here are not going to know how to handle it, man. They're going to freak out. I, why would you freak out? Because it's going to screw up their entire idea of like Some you know people. what the universe is and who God is and I'm, who created gonna, what when and for what reason and all I'm going to contend with you a little bit on that. I'll tell you why. I we've had generations of people now in living in the space age, right? Mm -hmm. We've had we have the information age, we have the internet. I think that the idea that that we are not alone in the universe, or we certainly it's possible we're not alone in the universe and I think that that knowledge is out there and I, I think that it's mu a panic is much less likely. I think there's just a critical mass of people out there that, that will accept this. And to be honest with you, the people that, that couldn't accept it, like say people that are fanatically religiously fundamentalists, right? The people protesting outside Planned Parenthood, in other words. Uh, which the crazy day. thing is, like <laughs> they, they could go the other way, they're like, see, not, lo God loves life so much that he makes it everywhere. And we shouldn't kill life over there, and we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't do abortions. I mean, there's so many ways you can go with that. Like, like for instance, um, 
you know, look at the different religions. I mean, um, Hindu Hinduism believes in this massive universe of multiple worlds, right? So yeah, we've got no problem over with that. A million different gods and I've, goddesses. I've talked to Muslims. Some some are like, no, there could never be life anywhere because you know that that's just a way to make it seem like uh, life here is less important. Others are like, well, in the Quran it says that Allah is Lord of the worlds, not the world, but the worlds, and therefore there is life otherwhere. Christians, same way. I've heard Christians say, no, Adam and Eve, that's the only life here. Where others are like, well. No, that's what happened here, but because God is omnipotent and omniscient, God could make life all over the world, you know, so it, yeah. it, it can be interpreted in many ways. It's so cool, though, because um, there's also other potentials with space exploration, like in the, there's actually a video game <laughs> uh, where uh, it's called Mass Effect, and basically um, these humans like went out into space and started exploring space and then they discovered this new property of energy and matter this new pro law of physics mm. that allowed them to like bend time and, space warp yeah thing. space warp and do stuff like that like man I, that's that's the kind of thing i would want us to discover through our space travel you know something really cool like that well I, really I, I would want everything. two things to like because i read a lot of sci-fi and i'm a die-hard Ever loving Star Trek fan, right? You know, live long and prosper, right? Um, so here's what I'll say: the longevity technology that they have in in some of these sci-fi novels, like where where you know, let's say I, I make it and I'm 75 years old and I'm all decrepit and shit, right? And they're like, we've invented this new nanotechnology. They inject me and like, okay, I'm like I'm I'm 19 again, right? Right. Physically, but I'm I got all my experience. If they did that, I'm like, give me the warp drive. Yeah. Because because if, if I'm gonna live another two or three hundred years, I want that warp drive. I want to see this universe. I want to see what it's about. But warp drive was basically invented uh, in science fiction because it's so it's yeah, a, get past the light barrier. Ha, you know, just so they can write about other locations because yeah. otherwise we can't get there in under a hundred years or something. Yeah. But now there's actually a theoretical basis. They're talking about the Alcubierre drive and uh, the possibility that it might be possible to warp space and you know who knows. Who knows? We live in interesting times, which is a Chinese curse, but it's it's also, it really is an interesting time we live in. And if we can get past all of our petty differences, and they are petty, they are petty. It is possible for people of different religions and cultures to find a way to coexist. It's been done multiple times. Maybe if we got rid of the, the banking system and uh, the military industrial, maybe if we tame them, you know, it, it might be a possibility. So. Just because we all cheer for different soccer teams doesn't mean we can't put our our differences aside at a certain point and cooperate on certain hey, things. It doesn't mean that soccer fans and badminton fans can't sit down and and have a few yeah. mimosas or whatever, you know. But um, is there anything else about um, space travel in particular that you want to talk about? Me? Yeah. Okay, the moon. Okay. The cool thing about the moon is. We don't want to go there and just take pictures or land and say, hey, I'm a hero, I arrived, and go back home. We've done that. It, it's not that cool. It, it didn't do that much for us. What we want to do there is we want to put something there that builds. It could just be robots that tear up moon rock and mine the materials and make stuff. Because when we get an industrial capability on the moon, right, and it could all be solar power, and there may be... Uh, fissionables on the moon, like nuclear power, yeah, which is interesting, right? Once you build a moon base, an industrial base on the moon, it gets super easy to go to Mars because the gravity on the moon is so low. The biggest thing hurting us is is the fact that it it costs a lot of money and energy to get off of Earth because we have to escape the gravity. Yeah. Although once again, I'm going to talk about Elon Musk. He by creating a, a launching system where all components can be can land and be recycled, he cut the half not by half but by more. You know, he, he always says, <coughs> imagine, "Imagine if every time you went from California to New York, you had to throw the car away and buy a new one." Right? Yeah. That's what it's like. So, what what about you? What do you want to say in in conclusion? Well, I just think that the day that we can overcome. Uh, something like the light barrier would be the day that all of this cosmology and astronomy became very real to us and that's going to be a momentous day but at the same time part of me feels like man i don't even have time to explore all of the different interesting places on my own damn planet my own home planet 
I still haven't been to where this guy's from. New you know, Jersey? New Jersey, yeah. But I think I'm going to go use warp drive to explore some other uh, civilization on some planet in Alpha Centauri somewhere. So to me, the world is already enormous. And, uh, and travel broadens the mind. Yeah, it's just going to be very interesting. If we ever make that sort of a leap forward in science, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, future humans handle that dilemma uh, this, of just being <laughs> overwhelmed by the sheer enormity of what of what is out there. You you just sparked a thought, okay? For example, I've I've traveled internationally and nationally, right? Mm -hmm. I've been on both coasts. I've been Turkey, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Afghanistan. Brief stopover in Germany. Brief stopover in Rome. I've lived in New Jersey, New York, New York City, as a matter of fact, Pennsylvania. Virginia and Florida. Okay, so I've, I've been to a few places. Yeah, but I like I did never did much with the Midwest. If you would have told me you're going to wind up moving to Missouri, I'd be like, what kind of drugs are you on? <laughs> I don't know jack about Missouri. Why would I ever go there? Like, what are we? What are they knock me unconscious first and drag right. me there? Or whatever. But necessity brought me here. There was an economic collapse, and there's a whole story behind that. My personal story. Necessity brought me here. So I'm saying, like, even if, even if all the nations decided we're not going to go to the moon, we're not going to go to the Mars, we're not going to bother, mm -hmm. right? It's too expensive. It's too dangerous. Something might happen in the future where people ha go there by accident. Maybe they establish space stations as habitats, you know, to do industrial work, yeah. and one gets knocked off. Or maybe something happens on this planet where people have people have to leave or die. What if a small group of people, very intelligent, technologically literate, right, are being persecuted? That's happening here in the U.S. Now we've we've got political entities and people that that seem to be anti-science or against this branch of science, that branch of science. And what if what if they had the capacity to leave? They're like, you know what, let's just take our high tech, our nanotech, our AIs, our, our industrial lasers and just move to the moon where these people can't bother us. Because <laughs> that, yeah. that's how a lot of a lot of migrations and civilizations that's how it happened, you know? Yeah, they search for greener pastures. Or Literally, in some in cases. In the case of uh, the moon, I guess, uh, impact crater laden, Caverns. <laughs> cavernous gray pastures. But um, yeah, I don't really have a lot else to say on this subject, but uh, Belita, do you have any other last points that you want to make? Uh, let's hear from, from you guys and girls, you know, the, the 20 people that listen to our talk sometimes. You yeah. Know. Uh, we want to. Do you have some other topics, particularly, we're both sci-fi fans, and I would love more topics where you're like, how does sci-fi relate to X? How does sci-fi relate to Y? And, uh, you know, we'll do it. And um, certainly like and subscribe if, if any of you want to uh, chime in. Hey, come, come over. Maybe we'll, we'll film you, too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing this talk. We're going to try to do more of these. They're a little bit more in-depth than the song reactions, but we're going to try to keep up a steady stream of these as well.